my name is Janai Thornton, and we are so excited that you are here. Um, if you're here, that means you're already a member of the Thank Me Later community, and we are so excited about that. Yeah. We are happy that you're part of our community. And um, every session is um, important to me. You know, I look forward to all the conversations that we have. But I have to say, September is very near and dear to my heart because I'm a big advocate of education. I had the gift of going to school. David and I, my husband, have already had the privilege of putting two children through college. Happy that's over. If I could do a <laughs> round off backflip right now, I would because that's how happy I am that I'm done with that. But welcome everybody to navigating the financial aid process in undergrad and graduate school. Because normally we've had these conversations in the past. I've um, had several conversations with Lenora. I've had one with Ashley before. Never at the same time. People never get to hear about grad school when it comes to money. I know Lenora even had questions about that. It was funny how curious <laughs> Lenora was about that. But i um, super excited about the guests that we have today. So we have Ashley Davis, who's the Graduate Financial Aid Manager at Georgia State right here in Atlanta, where we are with over 10 years of experience in financial aid. Hey, Ashley, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah, so glad that you're here. And then, of course, we have in the studio with us, we have Lenora Jackson, who's the Director of Financial Aid at Spelman College. Um, you've been there, what, 22 years? Well, let's not talk about just <laughs> how long it's been, Janai. Just say that I've been there a good number of years. And, and the reason why I want you to know that Ashley has been um, in the financial aid for over 10 and Lenora has been over 20 because that means there's not a question that we cannot ask today. That's the reason why I think it's important. So I hope you all have your questions ready. Like, when do you ever get access to people like this, where you can ask whatever you want um, and to get the direction that you need? So whether you have a child in high school, middle school, you have a child in college, you want to go back to school. Like, if you don't take advantage of being able to ask them these questions, like you are really, really missing out. So please take advantage of that. So again, welcome again to the Thank Me Later community, where it's designed with us women in mind. So it is just for us. And this is your safe space to get the direction that you need, because we all know that you can manage paying your bills and you can check your balances and you may even be able to keep up with your budget. I know a lot of us wish we could do better with that, but there's so many other financial things that you need to be focused on. And so we've taken the guesswork out of it for you. Every month we will guide you on what we're going to focus on. And September is all things financial aid, all things scholarship. So we've got some great programming for you. So ladies, I think we're just going to jump right in. I wanted to share a couple statistics before I um, started asking some questions. Um, total of $1.7 trillion in student loan debt, and that's just in the United States. So that's $1.7 trillion. That's with a T, okay? <laughs> I don't know how many zeros that is, but that's a lot. It <laughs> says, so according to the National Center for Education Statistics, black college graduates have an average of $52,000 in student loan debt and know an average of $25,000 more than white college graduates. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is because now more than ever, you know, black people are going to college more than ever before. You know, before it was questionable whether we were going. We are absolutely going to college now, but we're not prepared for it. So we're getting a lot of student loans to get through it. And that's why we want you here, because we don't want that to be your story. Absolutely. Want to make sure that you can manage this financial aid process. All right. So we're going to um, jump right in. And so. Ashley, hold tight for a second because I want to ask just a couple of questions related to undergrad. And if you have anything to share, chime on in. Please go ahead and join us, too. And then, um, okay. again, send your questions. Ani Anderson over here is got your questions in the queue. We are getting ready for all of you. So FAFSA yes. um, stands for? Uh, federal you would Wait, ask me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Free application. <laughs> Free application for federal student aid. aid. You yes. know, when you hear it all the time, you, you don't, don't even really know what it stands think about for. What it stands for. And that's why I wanted people to know it's coming out October the 1st. Yes. Okay. So applications will be available October 1. And it's very, very, very important that they do it. 
And because it's free, right. you definitely want to take advantage of the application. But Lenora, can you explain to people why it is critical, imperative, whatever word we want to use, that they apply right away in October? Well, one of the things, Ani, people have to be have to realize institutions only have limited dollars. Okay. First of all, pre application for federal student aid means just that right. federal student aid. Okay. If you're going to need federal money to go to school without the FAFSA, you cannot get it. Most schools will use that to determine how much institutional dollars they will give a student. So if you're late applying for your application, that means that institutions will run out of money very quickly, and then you're stuck trying to figure out, how am I going to pay for school? There goes student loans. Right. And so what that means is that money is first come, first serve. First come, first serve. So whoever gets that application in first, they're at the front of the line. Yes. And so just for clarity, because it comes out October 1st, but we're talking about for fall 2022. Absolutely. Spring 2023. Absolutely. So you have to start now in October for fall of 2022. Yes. Okay. And so what most students don't realize, school just started, and you're asking me to do an application for next year. Absolutely. So students who are in school right now who started college this fall have to do another application right now. in less than a month. If you're planning to start school in the fall of 22, then you have to do your application right now. And most times this is before you've even applied for college. So you have to have some idea of where you plan to apply to go to school because you have to put down those schools on the application. Okay. And so, Ashley, help us for those of us who are interested in going to graduate school. So I know there's no FAFSA for graduate school, but is there any sort of application or important deadlines folks need to know about? They're still going to do their um, FAFSA for grad school. Um, so you'll still be doing that free application for federal aid for grad school as well. I if thought you that was only for undergrad. Loans. Oh, for student no. loans only. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so obviously there's no Pell Grant. There's none of that other free money for grad school. Undergrad, now your grad school is too bad, so sad. Yeah, no, ma'am. There's, no. there's not. Go ahead and tell us the bad it's news. A, it's okay. Tell us the bad news. Yeah, yeah. As a graduate student, I mean, when you're doing your FAFSA, you're applying to for eligibility for your unsubsidized Stafford loan. So there's not even subsidized at a graduate level. It's going to be your unsubsidized staffer loans. They do start to accrue interest when they disperse. But you have to have that FAFSA done to even be, you know, to even be eligible for that. Without a FAFSA, you, you can't receive that funding. You cannot get those loans. Okay. Yep. All right. We have some questions, ladies. And I might have to work a little backwards because one is specifically about FAFSA. Can you amend your school list on the FAFSA after you submit it? So the question is, can you amend your school list after you've already submitted your FAFSA? Absolutely. So what happens is there used to be 10 slots for um, students to fill in for 10 schools. They've lowered that number. So what you have to do is once you've submitted it, you'll have to go in hoping that that school has already received your information, take a school off, add a school. So each time you'll have to go in and add schools to your list if you decide later that, oh, I forgot I wanted this school to get my information as well. Okay. Great question. Thanks for asking that. So I have another hello, Long. She has a question regarding loan forgiveness programs. And I know we briefly talked about these loan forgiveness programs, but I am 20, a 28 year old career public service employee. I tried to apply for the loan forgiveness program and was told I did not qualify because I did not have the certain type of loan. This school loan was for grad school back in 2003. I took the loan that was offered. Therefore, I don't quite understand that I, what I was told. At any rate, are there any other options for someone in my position to receive loan forgiveness or is what I was told true? So uh, I'm gonna probably pivot this to Ashley uh, since we're talking about graduate school loan forgiveness right. um, and Ashley I can chime in too 
on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah feel free. Okay, um, all right, I'll feel chime free. in. So he, here's the bad news about loan forgiveness. I read a statistic, I think it was late last year, that I think it's, um, it's less than 5% of people who are actually approved for loan forgiveness. OK, so I don't know why they make such a big deal about this program. And I think under the new administration, they were supposed to be reevaluating it because why say I work 10 years in public service? I'm a teacher. I'm a whatever. Um, I work in nonprofits. And I did all of this so I could have my student loans forgiven. Absolutely. Unfortunately, the statistics, um, um, it, it's pretty sad. And so, honestly, I don't have a resource for you for that um, other than um, using the Department of Education's wow. website. That's really my go-to site for everything. So at least I know that's a reliable site. And in that way, the information that I'm getting for sure is valid. So if there are any other programs, they'll all be listed there. But again, the numbers are, um, you know, really Dismal. alarmingly low. Yes. How few people get approved. This is random, but some things I've been reading lately about employers contributing to student loan forgiveness instead of contributing it to maybe a 401k, giving the employee options. So now with, you know, pandemic and all these things that are going on, you may just also want to look at opportunities of other employers to see if they're offering, you know, people go to Google for all these great things. You know, if reducing your student loan is a priority. Maybe look for some employers with um, those opportunities. And, and Ani, I'm happy that you mentioned that because um, the reason why employers are doing that is because the federal government has pro provided incentives. So if an employer pays their employee student loans, that's actually fully deductible for the employer too. So it's just it's a win-win for both. And so you, you may want to kind of gather together around mm -hmm. some of the other employees and kind of make an appeal to see um, if your employer can can provide some additional incentives. Next question. Can child support affect the amount received for, finan for financial aid? So let me just say this, that on the FAFSA, when you fill it out, it does ask you if you have paid child support. It does not ask if you're receiving child support. So what you are supposed to do is list down all income that you are receiving. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'll leave the question. Um, to be honest, right. there's a $5,000 penalty for uh, being dishonest on the FAFSA. So when it asks you what income do you have coming in, you're supposed to put down the income. But in terms of do you, is there a specific place that asks you uh, how much child support do you receive? There isn't, but they do want to give incentives for those parents who pay child support out to someone else. Understood. And that makes sense for that to be part of that equation for your expected family contribution. Exactly. Okay. So I have another question. If I have a full-time job with a decent income, can I qualify for financial aid for grad school? So I'm going to give that to Ashley. Yeah, um, and yeah, I mean, yes, but just keep in mind that it's unsubsidized Stafford loan. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not scholarships and it's not Pell Grants. Um, you could literally be making $10 or you could be making $10, $10 million and you would still, you know, as long as you meet the criteria for the FAFSA and you haven't exceeded your aggregate loan limit, you can still receive unsubsidized loans for your school. So I, for grad school. I, I'd like to chime in on that. In terms of when you're talking about you make X number of dollars, do you qualify for fi for any financial aid? So you may not qualify for federal dollars, but when you're looking at the institution that you're going to apply to in terms of going to graduate school, you want to look at that school for what type of scholarships do they have for graduate students. Because understanding federal dollars is never going to do it, even for undergraduate. So when you're talking undergraduate, you're looking at Pell, which is only a little over $6,000 a year or SEOG, which is Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant. Those are the only federal dollars you're really talking about. So whether you're going to undergrad or you're going to graduate school, the best way to go is free, and the m main way you're going to be able to go is to receive some, some type of scholarship. 
So what I hear you saying, Lenora, is um, based on completing the FAFSA, you probably are not going to get enough money to cover your tuition, room and board fees and all of that. Absolutely. It, from federal aid, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay. Regardless of school, probably, too. Maybe for community school or Maybe, schools that are cheaper. Yeah. I would say even with community college, when you're talking about tuition fees, room and board, it's probably not going to be enough. Now, maybe a small school like that could piece together some other funds that would pay for tuition fees, room and board. But when you're talking about four-year institution, be it private or public, okay. you're not going to receive enough in federal aid. Okay. And just to um, re reiterate what Ashley and Lenora are both saying, you definitely want to watch the session that we just had yesterday, which was all about scholarships. So please go back into the community. You want to check that out because, yes, complete the FAFSA. Yes, do what you have to do. But you're going to have to apply for that scholarship money, too, as well. Um, Ashley, I have a question for you. Um, it seems sure. like schools don't provide as much scholarship money at the graduate level. Do you know why that is? No, I don't know why. However, a lot of our graduate students have really um, been focused on looking at GRA positions. Um, and so that does help. What does that mean? Um, what does GRA mean? Scholarship money. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what does GRA mean? So that's a graduate research assistant. Um, so it's somebody who is going to be on campus maybe 16, 20 hours a week working in one of the offices, maybe studying under a professor, um, but it's, they will accumulate money that will help towards their tuition and fees for the semester. And you can also earn a stipend in those positions. So they're literally like, you know, part-time jobs. Um, so you can earn a monthly stipend as well. And we've had quite a few students who do use that and utilize those funds, which, which do help. I mean, it makes a big difference. It can make a big difference. Okay. Ashley, can you just say about how many positions a school like Georgia State would have for graduate assistants? Oh, gosh, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure. Um, you know, just in the, the College of Business, it's, it's incredibly competitive for sure at a graduate level. Um, but in terms of the university as a whole, you know, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but we do have them work directly with our career services department um, that's what they would be applying at so that might be just a good point of reference for students in any school you know to to chime in and link in with your career services department to see what kind of opportunities are out there or if there's a professor or a certain area that you're really interested in i mean there's even gra positions in the athletic department you know depending on which depart which direction you're looking to move into that's something you definitely would want to explore if you have the time though because there is the time requirement for that too you know it's like having a part-time job so it's, it's a matter of if you can balance it with whatever full-time position you may have okay and then ani i'm curious because i know that um you went to FAMU undergrad, but University of Miami for graduate school, but you had your tuition paid for. How were you able to make that happen? And so Lenora and Ashley, were, we were talking about that before we started today, and I asked about any graduate feeder programs. So Florida A&M had a graduate, and I think they still do, graduate feeder program, and it was a list of schools that had a relationship with FAM, and if you applied and got in, then they paid 100% of your tuition. Mm. So the only catch when I arrived at University of Miami, I wanted to take some additional hours. And so they capped it and I did not know that. However, got to the university, they were like, oh, no worries, we'll cover that. Mm. I mean, it was the simplest, pro I was amazed. Right. I was like, so you're saying you're <laughs> going to cover that <laughs> for me to go to school? right? Um, but what I will say, and Ashley, I'm also curious from your um, standpoint, what do you recommend? So I was a student like that who had a full ride, but I had to live. Right. right. So they only covered your tuition. Correct. I stayed off campus. Okay. Um, I needed books. I needed to eat. Right. And I had a little, mm, little cute job, you know. It it wasn't really doing anything. And so my debt, my only school debt came because I took out loans to live. Mm -hmm. But hindsight 2020, I'm like, I know I could have done something different. I could have figured out a different way. I am right now $3,000 away from being, like, student loan free. 
Yes. 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 <laughs> but I'm mad because darn it, I probably shouldn't have had any of it. So, I mean, just That's from a perspective of somebody though. who is considering, what do you guys advise on living costs? On? Like, do you do you really take out the loans for that, right? I mean, even at the graduate level, or is there another another option? I mean, there are plenty of students who are, yes. And that's why I always like to kind of highlight borrowing responsibly um, because it's very easy to accept all of the aid and cap out and get these huge refund checks. And they look great in the moment, <laughs> but you owe them back, you know? Um, so trying to have those level-headed conversations about, you know, planning for the future and what kind of debt you're getting yourself into. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, looking at GRA positions, if something like that, a graduate research assistant could fit into your schedule. Um, you already, in your position, we're already receiving scholarship money. Um, maybe if you have a job that's outside of the university, looking at your tuition reimbursement programs with your employers. That's a great um, they, idea. They, they, they do exist still. You know, there are still employers who are paying, um, whether it's 5000 a year um, I've had some that are that are literally, you know, paying their students tuition, their employers tuition or employees tuition. So it's, you got to, you know, you got to put in the time and, and the research and ask the right questions and look in every corner to see what you can kind of collectively come together with um, so that maybe there's less out of pocket, less student loan debt that you're borrowing. Yeah, I, I think, Ashley, you've said it. It's research. And so many times um, for undergraduate students, they're not doing any research. Uh, they said, oh, you can go here for free, but they haven't thought about how they're going to live or eat when they get there. And the only way that at that point, they're kind of stuck. They have no other recourse but to take out the student loans, loans because they haven't done the research that's required. And I think it's something, Janai, that you really need to talk about with your kids right. long before they get to undergraduate school. What does it look like for undergraduate? What does it look like beyond undergraduate school? Because you have these students who want to become medical doctors. Sure. You have these students who want to get PhDs. How are you going to pay for it? Right. Um, I, I think the data shows that the average student loan payment right now is somewhere in the high 300s. So that's average. So that means there's people paying significantly more than that and obviously people paying less. But that's a commitment. And that's like a 20, 30 year commitment. So we want to think about what we're committing our children to, what we are committing to ourselves. And please exhaust every possibility before you just sign up for those loans for sure. You have some other questions from the community, Ani? I do. So somebody came back, I think, with the same, with the FAFSA question. She said, under question 92C, as for parents, parents' child support received, will this affect the amount received for financial aid? So if the parent receives a small or a large amount, and I know you talked about that, but will it affect the amount that that, that parent can receive in financial aid. So let me, let me just say this. The federal government's going to look at all income. So whatever you put on the FAFSA, it could affect the amount of money that you're going to receive in terms of federal aid. So it goes with how much money you earn, how many students are in college, how many people are in the household. All of that's taken into consideration when they come up with what is your estimated family contribution. And that is the key. What does the government say that your family can contribute to this student's education? So, yes, it could affect. Okay. And I just have a follow-up to that because I know we did a session with Desiree, our scholarship expert. She talked about even though she had kids in the same grade, one a year or two after and her contribution was still something ridiculous so even though she made a decent income she was sending three kids to college within two years so they don't consider how many of your kids like how many kids in your household are going to school at the same time they do uh, it just probably depends on what her income was because that's always taken into consideration if you have one student going to college this year and then next year you have two, but your income is the same, she should have seen a difference in her estimated family contribution because we have people who are, have three children in college at the same time. And each year that estimated family contribution should go down. 
if your income remains the same. Now, if your income goes up. With inflation and all the other. <laughs> yes. The 2%. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yes, it, she should have seen a difference in with the number increased in going students going to college. Okay. Um, it looks like somebody have another fam you I'm um, hoping graduate or here. She said the, there's the fam still has the graduate feeder program. So anybody interested in attending Florida A and M University <laughs> for your undergraduate degree, so Look, you can go to graduate school right on the house. <laughs> please please apply. A little shameless plug. Yes, there, for sure. Um, the next question: If my husband applies for the FAFSA to get undergraduate to get undergrad, with it will it negatively impact that? impact what would be available for my high school kid so so if the husband is applying like he's to going go back to school, to school gotcha. correct and he's okay. going to get his undergraduate degree will it neg negatively impact what what would be available for my high school kid no so it, it it goes according to each family member so if the husband is going to school the FAFSA is done for him and when her children are ready to go to college, it's done for them. So at that point, say the husband goes to college this year, next year it'll be the husband and a student in college, then the EFC should go down. So it's not going to negatively impact what her students are going to be eligible for. That's not how it works. But he would also be considered in the equation as somebody else who's in the household going to school. Absolutely. So that could actually help. That could help, yes.